You might think that getting £35 million for Danny Drinkwater, putting Harry Kane on corners, and the fashion sense of Manchester United players in 2005 were the worst crimes ever committed by footballers, but I'm here to tell you that isn't the case. Joey Barton once stubbed out a lit cigar in youth team player Jamie Tandy's eye, Breno Borges burnt down the 1.5 million euro villa that he was renting in Bavaria whilst playing for Bayern Munich, and Estonia goalkeeper Ewald Mixon was a Nazi collaborator and police chief whilst Estonia was occupied by the Germans during World War II. As a rule, I think that footballers are very often unfairly maligned in the media, portrayed as being thick, irresponsible and greedy, largely because it is one of very few upwardly mobile industries where people from working class backgrounds can earn enormous salaries. Naturally, when there are so many professional footballers though, an estimated 130,000 worldwide, some of them are bound to be absolute wrongs. Few things are more wrong than killing someone, I think it was Jesus who first said that, and in today's video, it is footballers who killed people who go on trial once again. Not out of morbid fascination, or because of the fetishization of crime and particularly killing that has become so ubiquitous in the media in recent years, but to look at the crimes they committed, what subsequently happened to them, and what all of that tells us about the world of football as a whole. I should clarify, killing someone and murdering someone are two different things. Murder is a legal term for killing that is unlawful and premeditated. Some of these players were convicted of murder, but others were found guilty of other crimes, having killed another human being. Without further ado then, whose only crime was failing to live up to his potential, here are seven footballers who literally kill people. Seventh, Bruno Fernandes. No, not that one. Manchester United's Bruno Fernandes may be guilty of many things, like being quite irritating and of downing tools in their 7-0 defeat to Liverpool, but I can assure you that those crimes pale into insignificance when compared to the crimes of the actual Bruno Fernandes in question in this seven. Bruno Fernandes das Torres de Souza, better known simply as Bruno, was once among the most highly rated goalkeepers in Brazil. Bruno made his name at Flamengo, starting in goal for the Brazilian Giants at the age of only 21, and racking up more than 200 appearances for them over the next five years. At one stage, there was talk of Bruno being called up to the Brazil squad, and of Barcelona looking to sign him. And in 2009, when Fabio Luciano retired, Bruno became Flamengo's new club captain. It was all going so well. Until, that is, Bruno kidnapped his mistress, had her killed, and reportedly dismembered her body, feeding some body parts to dogs whilst burying others under concrete. Yeah, I am probably going to have to elaborate a little on this one. It was June 2010. Age 25, Bruno was being linked with a move to AC Milan, but he managed to get his mistress pregnant. After failing to convince his former lover to have an abortion, Bruno denied that the baby was his, probably because he still had a wife, and refused to support the child. The woman, Elisa Samujo, also aged 25, then sued Bruno, and shortly after that she went missing. It wasn't until Bruno's 17-year-old cousin went to the police and told them that he, Bruno, and an accomplice named Luis Henrique Ferreira Ramau had abducted Samujo that Bruno was arrested. Bruno's friend and accomplice, Ramau, hired former police officer Marcus Aparecido to handle the killing, who did so by asphyxiation. As the gruesome details of the case were made public, it led to a national reckoning in regard to gender-based violence. Violence against women is a global problem, but Brazil ranks among the least safe countries to be a woman anywhere in the world. A 2015 government study revealed that every seven minutes, a woman is a victim of domestic abuse in Brazil, and 70% of women will suffer some form of physical violence at the hands of a man over the course of their lives. Bruno had already abducted Samujo once, force-feeding her abortion medication, and putting a gun to her head. When she told the police, though, Bruno accused her of lying, stating, 
It's not the first time she's lied to get me in trouble. She cannot cope with the fact that I don't want to be in a relationship with her. I will not give this lady the 15 minutes of fame that she wants so much. So, inevitably, nothing was done, and Bruno continued playing for Flamengo. Following Samujo's brutal and avoidable death, Bruno was sentenced to 22 years in prison, but he was first released after just six years and seven months behind bars. Despite fierce opposition from fans, women's rights activists, and Samujo's mother, Bruno was immediately signed by Boa Esporte Clube in Serie B, the second tier of Brazilian football. He was later rearrested, but released once again in July 2019, and he will serve the rest of his sentence under a semi-open system of remaining under house arrest at night. In an interview following his release, Bruno stated, What happened happened. I made a mistake, a serious one, but mistakes happen in life. I'm not a bad guy. People tried to bury my dreams because of one mistake, but I asked God for forgiveness, so I'm carrying on with my career, dude. It must be awful having people trying to bury your dreams. Just because you buried the dismembered body parts of a former lover that you couldn't feed to dogs. Age 38, Bruno has been without a club since leaving Atletico Carioca in 2021. Meanwhile, Elisa Samujo's remains have still never been found. Sixth, Lee Hughes. A brilliant finisher with a sixth sense for sniffing out chances, Lee Hughes started his career with a bang at non-league Kidderminster Harriers. Following 70 goals in 139 games for Kidderminster, First Division West Bromwich Albion, who had released Hughes at 15, brought him back to the Hawthorns, where he was an instant success. Prolific in the second tier, but significantly less so in the Premier League, Hughes was convicted of causing death by dangerous driving in August 2004, shortly after West Brom had won promotion back to the Premier League. The incident itself had occurred sometime earlier in the previous season, in November 2003, when Hughes lost control of his Mercedes CL55 AMG and sped onto the wrong side of the road, causing a head-on collision. Douglas Graham, a passenger in the Renault Scenic that Hughes collided with, was killed, meanwhile two others were severely injured. Hughes fled the scene, along with his passenger, Adrian Smith, which the prosecution alleged was because Hughes had been drinking and wanted to avoid doing a breath test. After 36 hours, he turned himself into the local police, and in court eight months later, he was sentenced to six years in prison. Released after three, half of his sentence, on good behaviour, Hughes was signed by League One side Oldham Athletic, who asked their supporters in a statement not to pass moral judgement. Hughes scored 26 goals in 61 games for Oldham, and briefly returned to the championship on loan at Blackpool, before joining free-spending Notts County, while Sven Goran Eriksson was their director of football. Hughes scored goals for fun at Meadow Lane, but in January 2012, he was charged once again, this time with sexually assaulting a woman in a South London hotel. In May 2012, Hughes was found guilty, not of the sexual assault charge, which was later dropped, but of common assault, and fined £500, though he continued to play for Notts County. Hughes was declared bankrupt in 2018, though presumably not primarily because of that fine, and he is still playing non-league football now for Stourport Swifts at the age of 46. Fifth, Gavin Grant. Gavin Grant never reached the dizzying heights of the Premier League likely Hughes, or links with Barcelona and AC Milan like Bruno, but he did also kill someone. So, that is something that they all have in common. Come to think of it, that's probably not a good thing. It would be better just not to achieve as much in football without killing anyone, but anyway, Grant didn't do that. Grant grew up around Stonebridge Park Estate in Brent, just a stone's throw away from Wembley Stadium, at a time when it was a hotbed of gang violence and had one of the highest rates of violent crime in the entire United Kingdom. The average age of gang members in London is just 21, and most first become involved when they are much younger than that. Grant was no exception, and whilst he had a promising future in football, he lived a double life. 
teammates and coaches knew Grant as a funny, endearing, a notably well-behaved young man who trained well and kept his head down, but outside of the sport, the reality was something quite different. Grant was first arrested on conspiracy to murder charges whilst playing for Millwall in League One, but he denied the charges and continued to represent the club. Grant was later acquitted by a jury, who clearly felt that there wasn't sufficient evidence, but after a supergrass, as the police refer to them, turned in several of his fellow gang members in return for a reduced sentence, Gang was one of those to be arrested, this time on a murder charge. That didn't stop Bradford City from signing him though, well aware of the murder charge at the time, but in July 2010, Grant was convicted of the murder of 21-year-old Leon Labasteed in a tit-for-tat shooting back in May 2004, when he was only 20 years old himself. Grant received a life sentence with a minimum 25-year term, which we are now 13 years into, with Grant about to turn 39. Fourth, Marcus Alonso. The fact that Marcus Alonso caused a fatal car crash is fairly well known now, though it has taken a while for that to become the case, but the details of the incident and its aftermath are still rarely discussed. That is all the more unusual given that Alonso was playing for Bolton Wanderers in the Premier League when the accident happened. The third generation of a footballing dynasty in Spain, Alonso's grandfather spent eight years at Real Madrid, meanwhile his father represented both Barcelona and Atletico Madrid, and won 22 caps for Spain. Alonso only ever played one game for Real Madrid before being sold to Bolton, threatening to become the black sheep of the family, and his career was thrown into further doubt when he was charged with an alleged crime against road safety, driving while over the alcohol limit, a crime of negligent homicide, and of causing reckless injury. Age 20 at the time, Alonso was back in Madrid from Bolton, driving a BMW with four passengers when he collided with a stone wall. One of the passengers, a 22-year-old woman, was rushed to hospital with an intracranial trauma, but was pronounced dead just 30 minutes later. Alonso was driving at over 70 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone in wet conditions, with a blood alcohol content almost twice the legal limit in Spain. Originally facing a prison sentence of four years, in the end, Alonso was eventually only sentenced to 21 months in prison, a whole five years later, in February 2016, and even that was subsequently reduced to just a €61,000 fine and a driving ban which he had already served. Alonso went on to star in Serie A for Fiorentina before signing for Chelsea, where he won both the Premier League and the Champions League, winning nine caps for Spain. And last summer, he returned to La Liga after 13 years away, signing for Barcelona. In addition to paying a €61,000 court-mandated fine, Alonso also reportedly paid €200,000 in damages to the family and another €300,000 settlement to remove the charges. In total, around a month's worth of wages based on Alonso's last contract at Chelsea. Third, Luke McCormack. Luke McCormack's case is pretty bleak, so I would say that viewer discretion is advised, though that was probably the case when you clicked on a video about footballers who have literally killed people, and we have already discussed someone who fed body parts to dogs. Like Bruno, Luke McCormack was a goalkeeper. Born in Coventry, he graduated from the youth ranks at Plymouth Argyle, where he registered his first team debut at the age of only 17 on the final day of the 2000-2001 season. It was in the 2003-04 season, the same year that Plymouth won promotion to the championship, that he became the club's number one. At the time of his indiscretion, McCormick was still only 24 years old, but he had already played 157 games for a Plymouth side that had just finished 10th in the second tier of English football. In June 2008 though, McCormick was arrested on suspicion of causing death by dangerous driving. McCormick was driving his Range Rover home from the wedding of Plymouth teammate David Norris when he collided with a Toyota Pravia on the M6 motorway in Staffordshire. The driver of the Toyota, Philip Peake, survived the accident with severe injuries, 
but his two young sons, Aaron and Ben, aged 8 and 10 respectively, were both killed. A court heard that McCormack had been driving like an idiot at over 90 miles an hour with a blood alcohol level that was over twice the legal limit. A month after his arrest, but before he had been sentenced, Norris, whose wedding McCormack was driving home from, celebrated a goal for his new club, Ipswich Town, by gesturing as though he was wearing handcuffs in support of McCormack. Norris, who was subsequently fined by Ipswich, denied that he was mimicking wearing handcuffs, though I believe he has since admitted that was the case, and has expressed regret. McCormack was sentenced to seven years and four months in prison, but he was out in less than four. Following his release, and still aged only 28, McCormack played briefly for non-league Truro City, before joining Oxford United in League 2, and eventually returning to Plymouth just a year after his release. McCormack went on to play more games for Plymouth Argyle following his conviction and prison sentence than he did before it, only leaving the club and retiring from football, now aged 39, at the end of last season. Second, Alexander Villaplan, a man who has cropped up on a couple of videos in the past on this channel, Alexander Villaplan was one of the very first people that I ever wrote an article about when I started in football journalism in 2015, though I've never actually made an entire documentary about him on this channel, because Tifo Football made a short video about him in 2018. Villaplan captained France at the inaugural FIFA World Cup in Uruguay in 1930, playing as a halfback, a now obsolete position in football, as Le Bleu beat Mexico 4-1 in their opening game before defeats to Argentina and Chile saw them packing in their group stage. Born in Algeria whilst it was still a French colony, Villaplan played for the likes of Nîmes Olympique, RC Paris and Nice at club level, but his career headed in rather a different direction following his retirement in 1935. Villaplan entered the underbelly of petty crime and had been convicted of fixing horse races before he had even retired from football, and at the beginning of World War II, he became involved in the Parisian black market, racketeering the local Jewish population under the Vichy regime, a puppet government imposed following the Nazi's successful invasion. Villaplan came to the attention of the Carlinga, also known as the French Gestapo, eventually rising up the ranks to become an SS Untersturmführer and leading his own criminal gang of Nazi collaborating North African migrants. Nicknamed SS Mohammed by the Germans, five days after D-Day and one day after the massacre at Orador Sunglan, in which several hundred civilians were killed as collective punishment for local resistance activities, Villaplan orchestrated the execution of a further 52 people in Musidam. Six months later, once France was in Allied hands, Villaplan was sentenced to death for his direct involvement in at least 10 killings, and he was killed by firing squad three days after he turned 40. First, Patrick Clivert. One of the biggest names in European football during the mid to late 1990s and in the early 2000s, Patrick Clivert was a 6 foot 3 inch whippet with fantastic skill, excellent movement, and dominant aerial ability. He starred, most notably, for Ajax and Barcelona, in addition to scoring 40 goals from just 79 caps for the Netherlands, a record of better than a goal every other game. Despite his attitude and character often being called into question, accusations that he never fulfilled his potential, and a premature decline, Cliver still won the Champions League, the Golden Boot at a European Championships, and finished 5th in Ballon d'Or voting at the age of only 19. I'm not saying that Cliver killing someone has been airbrushed from history, but I scrolled through his entire Wikipedia page and I couldn't find it mentioned anywhere. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that his name should be followed by KILLER in all caps in brackets at the top there, or even that it should feature in the first paragraph of his bio, but you would have thought that you could find a place for it in there somewhere. There is literally a whole segment dedicated to Clivert's personal life if you wanted to bury it away, which tells you the place in which his parents got married, but not the fact that Clivert accidentally killed another human being. 
it seems like rather a notable omission. Cliver was just 19 years old at the time, driving his friend's BMW M3, which he wasn't insured on, through a residential area of Amsterdam at more than twice the speed limit. Cliver was travelling at 104 km an hour through a 50 km an hour zone when he collided with the driver's door of a Ford Orion. The driver, Martin Putman, a 56-year-old father of two, theatre director, and lifelong Ajax fan, was killed on impact. Meanwhile, his wife, Hanny, survived as a passenger, but suffered serious injuries. Clivert admitted to speeding, but denied the charge of causing death by dangerous driving. He was found guilty regardless, but managed to avoid prison time, sentenced to just 240 hours of community service instead. Six months later, Cliver left Amsterdam to join AC Milan, and he was the Netherlands' all-time record goalscorer until his record was broken by Robin van Persie in 2013. That is it for today's video. It, it was morbid, wasn't it, if we're honest, but I think that it's interesting to see how different players have been dealt with in light of crimes and uh you know make of that what you will hit the like button if you not necessarily enjoyed but found it informative in some some shape way or form uh leave a comment if you have anything you want to say and obviously make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on both to this channel and my backup channel both of which should be on your screens now you can also find me on twitter or on instagram via the username at hitc7s on both should you wish to do so.